Think about this time of year and Valentine's and all these things with the celebration of love and all those aspects of what real love is. We forget so often that the basis of all genuine love comes from our Heavenly Father, amen, amen. who's given everything so that we can have everything. Praise the Lord. It's good to see you today. Boy, nice and crispy. Looks like y'all won the battle with the blankets and got up this morning, so. I didn't want to. I don't know about you, and I'm the pastor, so. I, <laughs> just, it's just that moment in time, you say. Call Brother Tim. No, I didn't, but uh, praise the Lord. Glad that you're here as well. We're continuing a series of messages today on our sync series, and of course, this is a popular terminology. It comes basically from the good old-fashioned word called to synchronize something. But getting our lives in sync, synchronizing obviously with our Father, and we've used this definition weekly as we've been in the series about getting in sync with Him so that our lives, we move, we operate, we're moving at the same time and the same rate. I really do believe it's in the design of God that when He made us, He made us to walk with Him in a fellowship so that we know His heart, we know His mind, we know His will. And then He's given us His Word, and then He gave us His Son so that we could have that relationship established uh, by having our sins forgiven because God is holy. So God makes us right with Him and brings us into a relationship. The whole series about getting the, the parts of our lives and every aspect of our life in sync with what the Father has for us. We've preached five sermons so far, which are on the screen there, without getting the right connection. If you don't know Christ, you know, then you're really not going to know God's will for your life. It's, it is the will of God that man walk with God and know God. Jesus gave us the format when he said in John 3, you must be born again. That's where the connection starts. And then from there we talked about getting the latest update. That's by just walking in a relationship with God, being sensitive to the leadership of the Word and the Holy Spirit in our life. We preached a message out of Ephesians where it said, do not grieve the Holy Spirit and what that means and how that really is a love term where we have this real close relationship with our Heavenly Father so we can know what His will is and what direction we're to go. Then we talked about different applications of our lives from finances and marriage and those things. But I want to talk about your love life today and because this is so important and we're not just talking about in the context of marriage or dating. and All that's covered in this, this message. If you're here, you're, you've been married for a month, a week, or all your life it seems like. There'll be some truth in this message, I think, it will really help you in your, in your relationship in your, in your own home. But maybe you're here today and you're engaged and you're uh, uh, looking for some answers. It just so happens this just happens to fall on the Sunday before Valentine's. But uh, maybe it helps you get some things and in, in, in really in inspection. You know, some people say, well, I believe in love at first sight. Some people say, I believe in taking a second look. But <laughs> nonetheless, wherever you're at in that regard... We ought to take a second look in regard to our relationship to, to, to other people and, and what it really means. And, and so we want to talk about what real love really is. And I, I really don't believe most of the world we live in understands it. We're here in the 21st century. We're filled with all kinds of modern technology. Science is abounding around us. But when it gets down to understanding love and the power of love that love really has, we don't live in a culture that grasps that completely. And that's why we, you know, you, uh, there's violence on every hand, crime rates soar, divorce rates soar, uh, churches split. And it really gets down because people don't understand what love really is and how to get along and how to love and how to, how to commit to one another. We use the word, you know, quite readily and very quickly and easily in our culture, but don't thoroughly understand what the word really means. We, we love our grandmother. We love our wife. We, we love Dr. Pepper. You know, we might, we might even love, you know, whatever, you know, our socks, our shoes, whatever they might be, or pickles. But whatever it is, we, we just, we love it, whatever the terminology is. And I think somehow we, we really missed it. It's like the young man was having breakfast with his father one morning. He was so excited, and the dad won't know what he's so excited about. Dad, I want to get married. He says, uh, do you think you're ready for marriage, son? He said, yeah, I really am. He said, well, are you in love? He said, oh, oh yeah, I'm, I'm sure I, I, that I'm in love, Dad. Well, how do you know, son, that you're in love? Well, last night I was kissing my girlfriend goodnight, and her dog bit me, and I didn't feel the pain until I got home. So that's not necessarily a sign of what real love is. But if we talk about it today, there is a passage of Scripture in a minute we'll look at and, and, and from John where, where the Lord says this in John 13, having loved his own, he loved them to the end. That's love. Love that overlooks things, love that sacrifices for things, love that's committed no matter what, a, a love that's to the end. Now, obviously, the end here was the earthly ministry of Jesus when he had his disciples. He said he loved them to the end. The, lo the Lord's love for the disciples was, was obviously ex exemplified. His love for you and me was obviously exemplified when he went to the cross and he died for us. Now, we know when he loves us to the end now that we have this relationship with him, 
uh, we're living in an everlasting time with, with our relationship with Christ. There is no end, praise the Lord, and so he'll love us forever. But the idea of this kind of love has been lost within the culture that we live in and certainly, if not lost, greatly diminished because we just don't see a lot of what I would call true love, real love, true love. You know, there's, the Greeks were a little better at expressing love and what it meant. The, what, the Greek language that the New Testament was written in was not as loose a language as the English language is when we speak about love. We use one basic term most of the time where the Greeks had three or four definitions for, for love. And I'll, I'll place them on the screen quickly. And we've talked about them in the past. We won't spend a lot of time with each of these. But these were the three words. And the English words from which we get our word from, there's the word eros. We get the word erotic from that. But the Greeks refer to that as a sensual love, a physical love, even and lust. Uh, the word phileo, we get our word philanthropist or philanthropist from. That's the word, that, uh, a love of human, humanity, and that's the kind of love we would use in regard to uh, a brotherly, sister, human type of love, where we, we love each other in that regard. Then there's that highest form of love that was not used to relate even to, 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 to mankind because it starts with God, and it's the word agape. You've probably heard the word, the terminology used before, and it is that unconditional love where God just loves us, you know, just unconditionally. He's given everything for us. Now, I believe that's the heart. That's the truest foundation of what real love. That's, that's the word it uses in John 3, 16, when God said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. When God gave up everything and committed everything. It was an agape love. And that's the kind of love that's lost in the culture that we live in today, the love that's willing to sacrifice, all right? It's, it's also found in Romans 5, 8, where God says, While we were yet sinners, God commended his love, and that's the word agape in the Greek language there. He commended his, agape, his love toward us. God, God committed himself to us even when we were not lovable. Uh, you know, the most am amazing scene and demonstration of love is, is when you see Jesus going to the cross and dying for your sin and dying for my sin and laying down his life. I mean, he, he lays out his arm. He says, no man takes my life from me, but I give it willingly. And uh, he stretches out his arms, and as they're nailing his his, his hands and his feet to the cross, the scriptures record the incident where it says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Man, what, I mean, you just can't look at the whole crucifixion scene of Christ and not be moved to tears over the compassion of Jesus Christ. And it wasn't about him just being a martyr and showing and demonstrating some kind of sacrifice. It really was to pay a price. The Bible says all of sin, and so he paid the price for sin because the wages of sin is death. He, be, he took on that himself, and that, that's a love. That's, that's agape love. In fact, that's that in spite of love. Even when we were not uh, lovable, God loved us. That's the way you could put Romans 5, 8. When you weren't lovable, when there was nothing commendable about you, God commended his love. When there was nothing that God said, well, you're just the best in the world, it's kind of like the video clip we just showed at the beginning where God just says, you know, bring everything. I love you in spite of everything you've done, everything you haven't done, your failure, success, if it, you just give it all because I will be your all. That's the kind of love that we talk about with, with the agape love. And, and, and there's just a great power in that kind of love that the world really doesn't dem understand or usually demonstrate. There's, there's great power in that kind of love when a marriage relationship discovers that agape love. There's great power in a relationship just between people or in a church when people really begin to discover that kind of love. It's astounding, that kind of love. It should motivate us. It should move us. It's, it's, it's a powerful love. What I'm going to share with you today, and, and I don't know that we'll even get through with our push through and probably shouldn't have in the, at our other campus this morning and, and finish, but I think we, we may slow down a little bit today and, and do this over two parts because there's so much here. The basis for this comes out of this message is something I preached a long, long time ago. I remember I wrote a book years ago called Love, Lust, or Romance, How to Know When It's Real. And it was written mostly for teenagers and college students, the book was, so that you know, they wouldn't be so easily confused in a world that likes to say love but has no idea what it is. And so the book was written there, and this is just one chapter out of that book on love, lust, and romances, which talks about, or seeks to give a definition to what it really does mean to say I love you and really mean it when you say I love you, because again, we're living in a culture that just doesn't embrace it. Let me give you a, a definition I came with in, in the writing of the book that I think it's, it's a biblical definition, but basically it's an unselfish choice for someone else's highest good. But I mean, when you go back to the cross and you think about what Christ did for you and he did for me at, at Calvary, certainly you see that. There was this absolute 
unselfish choice on God's part to send the very best for you and me to pay the price for our sins so that we could have a relationship with him and so that we could know him fully. And uh, sometimes, as we say, with, with the world we're living in, that kind of love is it, generated out of in spite of what you need. It's what I want and what I can get out of this. What are you, what are you going to give me? Again, the, the Bible says in Romans 5, 5, because the, the love of God is shut abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And what he's saying there is that once you come to this relationship with Christ Jesus and you discover the love of God in your life, that God does more than just exemplify his love towards you by, by paying the price for your sin and receiving you in spite of what you've done and forgiving you for everything. And that's glorious. That's agape love. But it goes on to say, God gives you the capacity to love that way. God gives you the ability to be that kind of person in a relationship. That's not natural to us because naturally we are selfish people. When you, when, you, when you ask somebody, you say, oh, are you in love? Oh, I know I'm in love. Like the boy that got bit by the dog. I didn't feel it. To, I know I'm in love because, I, you know, my heart just skips a beat and just races. And, well, why does it race? Oh, he's just so fine or she's just so great or she looks so good, you know, and on and on the definitions go. But if you really just dissect all that, it really gets down to I love them because what I'm getting out of this deal. They make me feel good. They make me laugh and on and on and go. And again, that's the way all love ultimately, I'm not putting that down, all right, because there's, there's an element to that where we're attracted to somebody in a relationship. But it, love goes much further than that than just kind of this good feelings that you get around from somebody. I think I put a little quote in the book that says, romance begins when you sink in their arms and ends with the arms in the sink. But it goes beyond that. Genuine love really goes to the place, you know, that... Uh, it goes beyond just a fleeting feeling that you feel from someone. It, it means that you're willing to make this commitment. We, we talk about marriage vows, you know, and, and when people come and, and they stand in the church before the judge or wherever, and they make these commitments, like these lofty vows, and, and they are. They, but it, it's like, that's what makes a marriage work. It is till death do us part. It is for better or for worse. And some people say, well, I, I said that, yeah, but I didn't know it would get that worse, you know, or, or whatever it might be for, in sickness and health. And so many people just bail out of those relationships, don't they? Just quit on it because they don't stick to what they promised to do. And many of them, well, they didn't realize what they were promising or the depth of what those particular words might say. Now, if you want a little follow-up material to this, you can go to 1 Corinthians 13, called the love chapter in the New Testament and get a little bit further uh, inside of this. But we understand from studying the Bible and seeing agape love and what that word means that certainly real love goes beyond romance and beyond fleeting feelings and obviously goes beyond the, the lust factor, all right? Uh, most people are drawn in by those other factors instead of the, the sacrificial commitment factor. I mean, uh, we had our wild game feast, by the way, yesterday. Had close to 100 men at this wild, the wild game feast, a great time in the Lord. And uh, our speaker did a great job. He talked about hunting and how that hunting is based upon deception. Uh, because you've got to deceive the deer and to, to, and to coming in and not knowing you're there and all the things that are, that are based upon that. But I got to thinking as he was talking about all that, when most of the big bucks and deer die, all right, they usually die for one or two reasons. They'll come to a particular baited area, perhaps, with an oat patch or corn feeders or things, or they come when it's the season for rut, we call it. And the rut is when the deer bucks are going to heat and they're going to... Pro you know, generate. There's just time to make more little baby bucks and baby deers, all right? That's for those who are older than some of the teenagers to understand. Anyway, <laughs> they come in, and it's that time, and those big bucks, they never show up in the rest of the year. You'll never see usually hardly ever those big, older, mature bucks. You know, they don't live to about 10, 12 years anyway at maximum. Most deer don't live past five or six. Most deer are killed on the highways, and they get killed on the highways because in fact, you know, there'll be more deer killed by, by cars than by hunters in the state of Texas because they come to the roadsides, especially in times of drought, because where the water drains down and more, it's just more water readily available as it's drained off the, the pavement and the concretes, and so they get this extra growth in the ditches. So they'll come, and they'll eat out of that, or they'll come to water in some of those places, and they cross the road, and they die there. The others come to, to, to feeders, and the big bucks, you, know, you won't see them usually even eating beside the road. They usually just come out for the other reason, all right? And they'll chase a doe in broad daylight across a pasture that's wide open where they normally wouldn't do that, all driven by one thing, this desire to uh, mate or whatever, all right? So, uh, like I said, I'll try to be as sensitive about these issues so as not to embarrass my wife. 
But when you talk about real love, it has to go beyond this whole idea of, you know, this, this, this physical pulsating thing that's going on in my body and this hormonal rush and surge. Love goes deeper and much farther than that. It is an unselfish choice for someone else's good. It does involve a decision that you're going to make to put somebody else above yourself or make somebody else's needs more important than your own needs. And what most people are saying when they say, I love you, it doesn't really have a lot to do with that many times. They, they like the person, they like the way they look, they like, the, as we said a while ago, the, the way you make me feel. And you really boil down to it, that's not an unconditional love. It might be able to grow to an unconditional love, but that's really a conditional love. And that's why it's so important that you understand the basis of real love and what real love is if you're going to enter into a relationship. Those of you that are, are, are teenagers or single or unmarried here today and you may be thinking about getting to a place or involved in a relationship or you're presently involved in a relationship, please understand that it's important for you to understand what love really is and what it means because you know, you're, going to, you're going to get older in life and I would hope that you want a complete life and a full life that whoever you end up with is the person that can bring fullness and completion to your life and the way that you ought to be bringing fullness and completion into their life and you understand what true love is. That's why I believe it's important to understand Romans 5.5, 5, that the love of God, that, that kind of love, the ability to love beyond yourself, the ability to, to really sacrifice, all right, more than just a mere noble effort of humanity, but something that's really inspired by God to be able to do, that, that, that agape love is given to you by the Holy Spirit of God. That's why I always tell people that are, that are dating or considering marriage, if you, whatever person you're looking at, it's important that they do have a relationship with Christ because they have to have a resource that they can draw from. I preached, that, I think it was part three in the series that we're in now, about how that we need to realize that, there, that, there, that there's really no one in the world that can meet all our needs. Ultimately, we have to understand that God's the one who created us. He's the one who knows us better than we know ourselves. And he's the one who longs to meet the deepest needs of our heart and life. God wants you to have a relationship and a walk with him. It starts there. That's the, that's the basis of it all. But then, please understand, you, you need to be the kind of person that can be a lover, a real lover that really can reach out and make some commitments and, and decisions in your life that you're very willing to sacrifice for. And you'll be willing to make the kind of commitment that you need in your life and they need in their life. And it's going to be from God himself who can give you this Romans 5.5 5 kind of a holy spiritual thing in your heart and your life that only God can do. And it becomes a case and a condition of you having the capacity in your life to have true love, real love. And again, the big question, well, what is it? How can I know it? How do I know if I'm loved? How can I, if, I, if, I, if I'm married, how, are we really loving in our relationship the way we ought to be loving or not? And so I think it boils down to some simple truths that I want to share that I really believe are biblical principles from the Word of God. This is not come kind of nice little bit of psycho babble that we're going through here. But I, I, if you look in the world around us, you'll see that the world just doesn't get what we're talking about today as we go through this. But if you get it, not only will you be able to experience a kind of life that God wants you to have where you are being loved, but you'll be the kind of person who's giving and being that kind of person who gives the love that, that needs to be given. Now again, these are taken from a chapter 6 of a book I wrote a long time ago called Love, Lust, and Romance. So we just kind of boil that, that chapter down into about as many points as we can get today, and we'll pick it up next week, all right? If that's all right with you, say uh-huh. <laughs> and nice, I get a stir stick with my water now. I asked them where the lime was when I walked up here, but they didn't. <laughs> For those who wonder about this weekly, I'm not telling. <laughs> no, it's just got a little peppermint oil. If you don't stir it, it burns like fire. And I know when Mrs. Lowry is mad, she puts this up here for weekly. If she's upset with me, she puts more of the peppermint in than she should. <laughs> so I'm on to you, Mrs. Lowry, all right? <laughs> but I know I haven't preached very well. It's real hot for the next Sunday. All right? She wants to fire me up and get me going. But anyways, we look at this about what real love is. True love, first of all, let's say this, it responds to the total person. You say, what do you mean? We don't live in that kind of culture. We live in a culture that just responds to the, f the physical, all right? You know, uh, how they look, what they look like, and how's that going to make me feel about my life? And we, we base a way far too much on, on, on the physical aspect of, of people's bodies and appearances. The music, the music industry, the movie industry, a lot of those have all had to, to play in those things and have really sold the public a bill of goods on what real, uh, the real issue is here. You can't look at people with only a physical eye. Last week I made the statement, you know, that we really, we, we're not... We're not a body with a soul. 
I think it was C.S. Lewis who wrote about this when he said, you know that mankind needs to understand that man is really a soul with a body. All right, this is the suitcase that carries who we are. Who we are is internal. And so many people look at the external and they think they're in love with an individual and they don't know anything about the internal individual. It just doesn't, they don't really understand what's going on. And they enter in so uh, loosely into relationships and make commitments in areas that they shouldn't be making in because they don't even know the other person as well as they may think they, they know them. They see a, a face, a smile, a, a twinkle in an eye or whatever it might be, and they miss the mark. Listen to what it says about Jesus in, in, in Luke 2.52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Now, there's four levels here that talks about it. It says that Jesus grew in stature, he grew in wisdom, he grew in favor with man, and he grew in favor with God. So you have the Lord Jesus here, and it says about him, he grew physically, he grew mentally, he grew socially, he grew spiritually. That's what it all breaks down to. Now, there may be a lot of people that you might be interested in as a person and perhaps drawn to, and you're, you're affected by the way they look in the external mode only, only within the context of the physical. Uh, and when you get to know them, you find out maybe this isn't someone you want to spend the rest of your life with. You know, they look great, but mentally, you know, they, they just, they, they lost something in the process. They don't get it. You ever hear of people like that? They don't get it. You know, it, they're kind of a narcissist in their, their personality. It's all about them. They don't understand anybody else or anything else. And if it's not about them, then there's no sense talking about it. That wasn't the Lord Jesus. He grew in every category. Socially, you've seen people that may look great, but, you know, they, they, they can't relate to other people in any kind of atmosphere whatsoever. They're, you know, they're, they're socially unacceptable in every kind of category. Spiritually, they, Jesus increased in favor with God. I believe these four dimensions of our life are something that every one of us need to realize about the other individuals. When I see you, there's more to me than meets the eye, all right? And if there's going to be this love relationship, you're going to have to come to the place in your life and say, I'm willing to love this person where they are and realize, you know, that there is more than just the external covering of a body. There is a soul inside there that, 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 that requires life and love and commitment too. And what happens with true love, it really becomes aware and the responsibility of every aspect of another person's life. So if you're willing to make this commitment to love, let me ask you, are you willing to commit yourself in these other areas of your life? Are you willing to commit to, 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 to knowing that person on these other areas of their life? Are you willing to bond yourself with that person in those other areas of their life? Because if you're not, then you're going to miss what that in spite of, that unique kind of love that God has for us. But it starts right here with all of me, not just the flesh. And again, it goes back to this simple point of Romans 5 where it talks about the, that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. God gives you the ability to love this kind of way. But man, if you're just looking at the outside shell, you're going to be thoroughly disappointed as the years go by. All right? Uh, well, you said he was a hunk, he becomes a chunk. All right? You loved that beautiful locks of hair that he had and you ran your fingers through them and it was so marvelous. Uh, you may find out as they get older in life, as you run your fingers through the hair, as much as is in your hand after that, it's still in her head. You know, she may, it, she may brighten your day by the beautiful smile, but the day will come perhaps when she's able to hand you that smile as she puts it in the glass <laughs> at night. Things happen. The body changes, all right? And if that's the base of your love, just how someone looks, you're, you're really going to miss the beauty of the relationship that God has for you and God intended for you. I want to get old and fat and bald, all right, with my wife, all right? I really don't want to be fat or bald, but hey, it's going to happen sooner or later. It just, uh, you know, I remember telling my son about the hunting thing we talked about yesterday at the Wild Game Feast. Dad, he said, Dad, how do you know when the buck is old and when it's young? I said, it's, just watch me. I said, as I age, this part of my face falls down to get these jowls going, you know, and get this thing going here. And I said, the older bucks, they have a little bow back, and they get this thing going down here, you know. So it just happens with time. Our gravity has a tremendous effect upon these bodies as you get older. The body changes, and ultimately, you were born because of sin in the world and the universe to die. We're all going to die one day. And if we die by old age, then, hey, it happens, all right? And there's going to be wrinkles and spots and all that kind of stuff that gets, goes with just getting older. And you need to be able, as you grow in your love and your relationship, to begin to love every liver spot you see, amen? And, and to love the skin on his head as much as you love the hair on his head. That's just part of life. But if you're one of these people who thinks that, you know, everything's got to be right in an external physical aspect, you're going to miss the beauty of the relationship that God designed for marriage to genuinely be. Genuine love, you know, is willing to, to, to receive the total person. And it doesn't matter what happens in later years, and you rejoice with each other. 
And so your, 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 your love grows deeper, not less because things change. The second part I want to talk to you about this morning was true love accepts the responsibilities of a relationship as well as the privileges. Uh, I think we titled this little section of the book called Willing to Pay, Not Just Play. But in our culture, it's just the opposite. We're willing to play, but we don't want to pay, all right? We don't want to make any commitments. We don't want to be in, have to do anything. We, we want a relationship. We want a physical relationship, but we don't want the commitments involved to make real love work. In fact, it says in 1 Thessalonians, when Paul's writing to Thessalonians, he says, you know, I remember without, without ceasing your work of faith and your labor of love. If there's real love, then there's going to be some commitments. There's going to be some work. There's going to be some tasks. There's, there's, there's commitments to make it work. There, there's been a term around it that's been a long time around. It's called free love. There's no such thing. In, in, in true love, real love, if you're going to express it in your life, is going to cost, and the cost is high. All right? But as you do that, you'll find out that so are the rewards. They are extremely high as well. I think one of the big problems with our economy for so many years has been the fact that people want, they want the rewards of labor, but they don't want to labor, all right? They want, they want the, the blessings of something, but they really don't, you know, we want to work less hours, we want more breaks, we want longer vacations, we want this, but I also want all the pay raises to come along with it, but I want to work less and do less. And we, we've just missed the mark of what God talks about in the context of real work and labor and rewards and fruit and, 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 and what the blessings of work are. Well, here we're living in a culture in regard to this relationship issue. They don't think about the commitment to marriage. We don't want that. We just want the fruit. We want the, we want, we want the relationship and we want the intimacy, but we don't want to make this commitment to, to marriage. And let me tell you, if that's where your mindset is right now, you're going to have an awfully shallow relationship. And the reason I say that, let's go back to what the verse I shared earlier in the message when, when I talked about the wages of sin is what? Death. All right, now the Bible says... And I, Please help, help here. I know and I understand that what I'm getting ready to say will be mocked and ridiculed by the culture that we live in, all right? I was going to bed the other night. I turned on Jay Leno, and he was having fun mocking anybody that believed that premarital sex was a sin or that believed that homosexuality was a sin, and they were just ranting, flipped the channel over Letterman. He was doing the same thing. You know, you're considered strange, odd, you know, because, you know, certainly time has changed. But time does change, but God doesn't, all right? God's word is still true, and God, in fact, God calls himself in Scripture, he's the everlasting God who changes not. We use a theological term for that, which is, is immutable. God is immutable, which means God never changes. So what's that mean? That means if God was for something 1,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, 5,000 years he's, he's for the same thing today. That's the beauty of God. You don't have to guess with him, all right? If God was, says, I'm against this, this displeases me, I don't like this, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 years ago, it's the same thing today. He's, he's still displeased, but he still doesn't like it. So what God was for, he's still for. What God was against, he's still against, which is good. That means I don't have to guess with God, all right? There's a consistency, a beautiful consistency with God. So when I talk about this context of premarital relationships and sexual relationships, or almost sexual relationships, I talk about it from the biblical context. And by the way, I don't make any apologies for that. All right, I really don't because I do believe that God's word is true. So here's what happens. If the wages of sin is death, we understand that death never really means cease to be in scriptural frank thinking and, and terminology. It is a Greek word when we talk about death in this context, which has to do with separation, all right, to divide something. If there's sin in my life, then I'm separated from God, all right? Eternally, what does it mean? To eternally die. It means to be separated from God forever, right? It's heaven or hell. I can be with God or without God. If I'm in hell, then I'm separated from God forever. Sin always brings death, which means separation. Are you with me? This means uh-huh, all right? Teenager listening faster. Y'all need to listen faster. It means separation. So let's put it in a practical sense. If I'm going to have a relationship and it's going to be based on what I want and disregards what scriptures teach and what God desires for my life and what is really he decides is the very best. God's not trying to keep something from me. He wants me to enjoy the best, all right? And I choose to say, well, I want my way over your way. Guess what happens? I move in this realm of sin and disobedience to God. Now, what does sin breed? It breeds death, which is? So here I am. I'm trying to draw closer to someone. How in the world am I going to be able to draw closer to someone if I'm doing things that create separation? Separation from them, separation from God, and, and separation from each other. 
Uh, that's not the intent. The intent of love is to reconcile, to restore, to bring together. So you can't enjoy real love and real unity and real intimacy if there's separation. Here's the beautiful thing. The Bible says in marriage the bed is undefiled. What does that mean? Well, I'll let you figure it out later, but it basically means that sexual relationships are completely acceptable in the eyes of God and within His will and purpose for your life to be enjoyed as a gift from God in marriage. All right? You heard me tell you, I said, told my children a long time ago, you know, you know, premarital sex is sin, but once you get married, knock your lights out. All right? It's, it's okay. All right? Don't look at me like that. God is the one who made a man the way He made man, and He made a woman the way He made woman, and said, be fruitful and multiply. All right? He made you that way, but He made you that way to, to come into a relationship of absolute commitment to one another. We stand in that altar and we say, I do, I do. It means, hey, I do, and I, I'm committed to whatever that it takes to make this relationship work. And this is part of our blessed relationship. We have been made one, all right? And it's not just being made one in the bedroom, all right? It's being made one in reality. The Bible tells us that God, you know, brings them together. Let's not be put asunder. So we're made one. That's why divorce is so horrible. For anybody that's been through one, you know it's like tearing your heart out. It's the fibers of your very being are being destroyed. And you know that no matter what you might try to cover it up, or the matter what you try to justify it by, you still sense the, the hard, harsh, cold reality of that. But genuine love is this thing which says, hey, I realize there's some privileges to the relationship, but I want to do that within the, the, the context of God's will. And it's not just about getting what I want in this relationship. It's about me being the person that God wants me to be and not doing anything in this relationship that's, that's going to press me farther away from God or destroy what I have with you. And so it's that idea that I'm willing to, to be obedient to God. I'm willing to be patient with God and, and realize that this responsibility God's given me is, is an awesome responsibility. I'm going to share one more, then we'll pick these up next week. But uh, the true love accepts the responsibilities as well as the privileges. Then the, the third is true love will display itself in mutual respect. Remember the old Rodney Dangerfield quote, I can't get no respect? There's a lot of people in marriage relationships say that a lot to each other. You don't, you, I just can't give no respect. I don't get respect. In fact, the Bible says in Ephesians, after it gives all this discourse on husbands and wives in the church, he says, so he ended up, he gives that little nutshell conclusion in Ephesians when he says, hey, see to it that each man loves his wife as he loves his own flesh and see to it that a woman respects her husband. Well, this is a mutual respect. In fact, before he gets into the discourse in Ephesians about the home, he starts off with this verse, submit yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord, which has to be willing to honor and respect one another. And true love has this, this, this element of, of a mutual respect for one another. It's not just the good feelings. It's not just the pleasure from being somebody. But it literally gets to this place where it'll manifest a respect for another person. And I believe so. The more I've been married, 36 now, years now, is the more I understand this. That genuine love, that you begin to realize that there is almost this sense of sacredness about it that God designed you, God designed this other person, God has brought you together in life, and you need to walk carefully and cautiously as you move forward with an attitude of reverence toward God, respect for this individual, so that what God puts together in uniqueness and, 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 and within His glory and His power is something that will honor you and honor God and honor the other person as well. But this has to do with coming to the place of saying, I'm going to respect you enough so as to not just realize this relationship about me getting something, you know, that I'm going to respect you enough that I am now concerned about your character. I'm concerned about your integrity. I'm concerned about your future. You know, there's so many people sitting around saying, I just don't know what went wrong in the relationship. Many of them, what went wrong is they quit respecting one another and they quit showing love that would give that kind of respect. That's why when you talk about the issue of adultery, there, there's absolutely no context of this whatsoever in the whole issue of adultery, is there? You, you, you don't respect your spouse anymore cause, or you wouldn't be out with that person in the, in the issue of pornography. All these other areas, you just lose the whole context of, of this, this little word, respect. But it finds its glowing greatest part within the context of loving people. I love my wife. I respect her. I will honor her. And I will do what I can to protect her in this regard. That's not what you see again, you know, you listen to music, you listen to country music, there's 
secular pop music of the world, you know, you, you get all these other things, and it's all about sex, and it's all about the pleasure of the moment, and what I can get out of it for me, and how this is going to, how I'm going to feel, and how you're going to make me feel, and you know, that's where you come up with the stuff, don't you wish your boyfriend were hot like me. Now, for those who don't know what I just said, all right, that's a song, I wasn't making a reference, all right? <laughs> it wasn't about me personally, I'm just saying that's the whole mindset of the culture. I, I need somebody that's a little hotter than the last person, somebody a little sexier than the last person, somebody a little more mojo than the last person, whatever it might be. No respect. It's not just a good feelings. It's not just about what you can get. It's not about the, uh, the rush, the moment, the adrenaline, the hormones. It's about real, genuine love. And as I say, our society is, so, is largely to blame for this lost concept of it. You say, well, Brother Joe, if I'm not married, then how far is too far? Well, that's a good question. Sometimes it's asked too late. How far is too far? Well, in the context of the church, you know, God gives us in, in relationship to Christian brothers and sisters, and, you know, in that relationship, he says, you know, how you, how you treat one another. He says, I'll tell you what, you treat older women like you would treat your, your mother, all right? You treat the older gentleman like you would treat your, your father, all right? And you treat the younger women like you would treat your, all right? So for you guys in the room, how are you supposed to treat this, the Christian girls around you? All right, you treat them like your sister. All right, That's, it basically it's an attitude of honoring them and respecting them. All right, and should God begin to allow development and relationship, then, then then everything changes. But it's still in regard to you uh, handling them. First Corinthians seven one. I'll let you look that up on your own. No, I won't. First Corinthians seven one. It's good for a man not to touch a woman. Oh, <laughs> that hit the brakes for somebody real quick, didn't it? <laughs> The word touch there, I mean, I, don't, I can't you know, be brushed about anything like that. It, just, it has to do with in, in a lustful way that you're trying to possess them in, in, for sexual purposes. Why? Because that relationship was designed for marriage. In marriage, the bed is undefiled. All right? But, you know, again, our culture does it. I just, I mean, it, whether you're watching from the 60s happy days or from the present, you know, Whatever TV show's popular, that's certainly, again, something that's very foreign. But it gets back again to this whole issue, I believe, of am I going to respect somebody? I believe if you say, I really do love this person, then Joe, well, how far is too far? Well, I believe if there's this agape love that's showing, then you don't want to do anything to ruin their character, their integrity, their relationship, just to gratify something for yourself. And that's, you say, that's a big, that's a big jump. That's a big, that's a big deal. That's a, that is a big deal. But if you're going to marry them, then there'll be time for that relationship. And it won't be based on just something selfish. It'll be based on something beautiful where there's a relationship of two people committed to one another till death do them part. And that's when it becomes a glorious thing in the eyes of God. So we, we begin to see just briefly, and we've only covered three out of the ten steps, three out of the ten things that love goes much further than what we give a definition to it in our culture and our society. But if you can be that kind of person where you realize the other person is a child of God, God has a plan for their life and a purpose for their life, and you can have the maturity about your life to say, you know, I just want to do what's best for them. It'll change the dynamics of a relationship, whether you're dating, engaged, or married. I just want to do what's best for them. I'm going to do what's going to make them a better person. And boy, that, that'll change your marriage real quick. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. It'll change a dating relationship real quick. It'll change an engagement process real quick. I, I really, I want to love them to the point I'm willing not to exploit for my advantage, but to really care about them so they experience the very best God has for their life. Amen? Amen. I want you to stand with your heads bowed, if you would, as we close this message today. I do want to give you an opportunity. Perhaps you're here today.